walking into a coma. And as the story goes from there, uh, about three years old or so, they found out I was deaf. So this whole time I was going through life, not, I couldn't hear nothing, you know? And so I, I started, and it started off with, um, I was biting my mom uh, and, and some, some of the issues that I was having. Um, and they thought it was, you know, behavioral or whatever it was, even though I could understand my dad and I, I got along with my dad. Then they found out, oh, by the way, <laughs> he's deaf. Hi, my name is Henry Mims. I'm 44 years old. I was born in Pensacola, Florida. I kind of moved back and forth between Pensacola and Miami um, for a long time, uh, going into 18 years. And uh, But as it started off in Pensacola, Florida, uh, 1978, I was born. Um, about eight months later, I got meningitis. And uh, as a result, I became deaf. So up until that point, I guess I, I, I heard everything just fine. Um, on that night, though, I was really sick. They took me to the hospital. And uh, when they took me to the hospital, you know, everybody thought, well, you know, it's just a flu. They didn't know that there was this meningitis thing going around, um, or how severe it was anyways. And so, okay, and then they took me back home. And by the time I got back home, I'd already gone up to 104, 105, I think almost maybe 106, don't quote me, but um, took me back to the hospital. When they took me back to the hospital, they didn't want to admit me. And unfortunately, you know, family friends had to come in and, and kind of make things right. Lo and behold, I had meningitis and it was killing me. So they put me into a coma. And as the story goes from there, uh, about three years old or so, they found out I was deaf. So this whole time I was going through life, not, I couldn't hear nothing, you know? And so I, I started, and it started off with, um, I was biting my mom uh, and, and some, some of the issues that I was having. Um, and they thought it was, you know, behavioral or whatever it was, even though I could understand my dad and I, I got along with my dad. Then they found out, oh, by the way, <laughs> he's deaf. So, you know, as parents, you know, what do you do with that? And, and I can't remember that time period, but I can imagine how hard it was for them because now how do you deal with the child? I shouldn't say deal, but how do you um, um, get on with the child? who, number one, can't understand you. Number two, you can't understand them. So, but luckily, I, uh, my parents were, were awesome parents. Like, awesome. And so, what they would do is, they, they never gave me any reason, ever, ever, to think that I could not do as others were doing. Ever. I could, and, and I, and, and, and you gotta understand, when I was, Younger, I didn't talk like I do now. And now nobody can tell where I come from, where I came from. People think I'm from England. Some people think I'm South America. Some people New York, Boston. They, they try to pinpoint where I'm from. And, I, and I'll explain that in a minute. But I would very, I don't know, no more than that. Because, I mean, you, you got to try to figure out how the sound sounds. But you can't hear it. And so what do you do? You do things like holding people's throats, watching their lips move. Um, and then putting the two together and then facial expressions and you know that's how you can pick up the tones and because it's very easy to get thrown off whether somebody's being serious or joking especially someone who's sarcastic for example so going into that you know learning how to talk and and how to understand the world around you um my upbringing okay it's very and I want to kind of differentiate between the two because there's a difference between what you understand when you're in it, when you're young, when you don't understand the world. And there's a difference when you've grown up and you kind of start to understand, wait a minute, it wasn't like I thought it was because this and this and that. But when I was younger, I always thought that my parents were too hard on me. They were too, they, 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 there was a lot of, a lot of, a lot of crying. There was a lot of not understanding. There was a lot of, you know, because you also get picked on. You also get all the people, and and it was just a nightmare for, for a little while. But I was always outgoing because I always had the trust that my parents, for example, they always instilled the belief in me that I was I was I was I was cool. You know what I mean? So I always felt like I was cool, um, even though I mean not everybody obviously, but um, but again, they 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 cut me no slack. 
So you gotta understand, my mom is an immigrant from Cuba. So she came, she fled um, the occupation with uh, Fidel Castro taking over Cuba, and her and her family fled. And they came to this country not knowing English, not knowing they came with a lunchbox, basically. Um, and they came and they had to start a whole new life. And they had to hit the ground running because that, that's, what else are you going to do? You're just going to float? No. So they hit the ground running. They had to learn a language while trying to learn a country, while trying to learn how to, how to just get on with life here in this country. So you have her, and then you have my dad, who, you know, was, was into protests and was into, was into civil rights and was into all those types of things. So there was no, there was no, oh, is it, nobody's going to treat you any different because of whatever you have. You are just as good as anybody, you know? Um, so I had those two influences in my life. So growing up, there were no excuses. No excuses. So whenever I would complain, it would get real, real quick. And there was no room for complaining unless there was going to be a solution. And then you could move on. You know, okay, well, what's the problem? All right, that's the problem. We'll try this. And it was just constantly trying different things. Granted, most of it failed. Most of it failed horribly. Um, and I remember growing up, my dad, you know, he would, he would box a little bit, and my grandfather was a gold glove boxer. So I, in turn, learned how to put him up, you know? And so in school, I was in special, I was in special ed until about the fourth grade, third, fourth grade. But I also, and it's not that the kids were bad or anything, it's they just didn't understand. And I guess a lot of them just wanted to be cool, you know? Um, and I hold, I hold no, no ill feelings towards them, uh, any of them, but they, they would do things like once they found out that I could fight, then they stopped coming from the front. They started coming from behind and it got much harder and, but, and you just didn't need to deal with it. And then just moved on and just kept going, going, going. Eventually it kind of started to taper off. But during that time, um, growing up and I don't know if this is biological or if it's just an environment that you're in. But I am extremely competitive, extremely competitive. So I did, I did sports, you know, and every sport I wanted to try, let's go, let's have at it. So I did football, I did baseball, I did whatever I wanted to do. I became a state bank BMXer, uh, probably by far my favorite sport I ever did. Um, we had to stop though because the economy went downhill in the late '80s, and BMXing is a pretty expensive sport, especially when you got to travel. Uh, at that time, I lived in Miami, so Homestead, you know, Boys Park, stuff like that, and uh, Boys Town, um, stuff like that. And then you'd have to travel to Orlando for states and nationals. So you'd have to try and travel to whatever state was holding the event. Well, when the economy goes downhill and your dad is a salesman, kind of messes with your money, so it wasn't as doable as it once was. Um, but I had a, like I said, I had a great childhood. Um, and then I also have a little brother. And so my little brother, you know, he was kind of a saving grace as well. Um, because in, in a world that, again, they don't know how to communicate with you and you don't know how to communicate with them. So what do you do? I, I tried to be as outgoing as possible, but I also had, the, there was a large part of me that just wanted to kind of just, just kind of stay to myself because there were times it just gets too hard. And it just gets too overwhelming. And even to this day, I take my hearing aid out because I'm like, I'm done. I don't want to hear nothing. The noises, it's just too much. I'm done. You know, it's like when people say to me all the time, oh, I'm sorry to hear you're deaf. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm really not. Matter of fact, I could not imagine my life not being able to turn it off. I just couldn't. I, I, would, I, I would go insane not being able to turn off all the noise. But... So, and growing up, and then I had my little brother as well. My little brother kind of helped me be more active, and he was always talking. He did not stop talking, always talking. But it helped me, though, because in him talking, I talk more. So, and I would do things like I would, I would get, um, you, you find out later on in life, you have these obsessions that you had when you were younger that you didn't realize were obsessions. Well, one of my obsessions was a thing called Mad Lips, which is, um, for those of you that don't know, it's like a, it's like a book, and what you do is, you know, you open it up, and, and the first page, it'll say, it'll give you, for example, a verb, an adjective, a verb, verb, 
pronoun, noun, adjective, verb, and it gives you all these things. And what you do is you write down just random things, and then on the next page, you just fill in verb for verb, and you just go down the list, right? And then you end up telling these weird stories, you know, and they're kind of cool and they're kind of funny. So, um, and you tell these weird stories. Um, but what that did help me to do was to understand how I could make things my own in a different way. See, because in, in English language, you're taught that this is the way you speak. It's this and this and this and this. But then when you try to apply it in real life, it kind of trips people up because you have, like, for example, you have so many words that sound the exact same. Like, for example, I'll give you an example. The word there. That's over there. That's their house. They are over there. You know? But when you're reading lips, it all looks the same. It all sounds the same. But when you're doing things like Mad Libs, you, got, you, got, you get to kind of understand how the language works and how you can apply it in your own way. One of the things that did help me with, though, is how many different words you can say for one thing. So it changes and it becomes more beautiful. It's like when you paint. Instead of painting all with one color, now I've got 50, you know? So that gave me kind of like an arsenal, you know? If you got a gun, you got bullets. If you got whatever, it, it gave me, it was like, that was my my superpower almost, you know? Um, so as time would go on, and again, I was putting them up and stuff like that, but then I started to realize that the way to beat, especially when you're young, you know, junior high, stuff like that, the way to beat them is the more you use this, the more they come. And the bigger and badder and stronger they are because now they want to make a name for themselves. Oh, this guy beat my friend over here, but let's see if he can take me. And then you end up getting, you're facing this guy, and then there's this guy behind you, and it just, it just gets into this big mess. Um, but I started to realize that what hurt people more than hitting them was the words that you, that, you know, like when you talk to them. And so what started happening was I started becoming quick and witty. And, and, and oh, you want to you wanna change words? Now you're in my domain. Now, keep in mind, I've been doing this for so long, quiet. And a lot of times I was just sitting there observing, just kind of watching, because one of the things you have to do is, as a deaf person, is you can't rely just on the lips. You have to rely on the body language. You have to rely on the facial expressions. You have to rely on so much that it's everything but the vocal that it actually tells you what I believe to be. And if you disagree, you disagree. But what I believe to be the full picture. A lot of times you're just talking to somebody and you just see this and you just take it for what it is. But I have a hard time doing that because I'm looking at people and going, you're lying. In my head, I'm saying this. But I also have to, with the with wisdom, I also have to say, why do they feel the need to lie to me? What am I presenting myself as for they don't, so that they don't feel comfortable with me to have an honest conversation, right? We can all make small talk all day long, but to have a legitimate conversation. Well, when you're younger, nobody really wants to have legitimate conversations other than he man, you know, um, saved by the bell, or did you see that this whatever, or at the time it was MC Hammer and Parachute, I mean, just like super, there was a lot, a lot of superficial conversation. I mean, when you're that old, how many deep conversations can you have except for, which is kind of a funny story, but which is kind of what led me to, to find and hang with all the crazies and the bums. Those are my people. And they always happen. And they aren't, they aren't like, they don't try to hide. They don't try to, even people that are perceived as crazy, they're telling you the truth 100%. And it might not be your truth. And you might look around and go, no, the walls are yellow. The walls are black. The walls are pink. And you're sitting here telling me the walls are blue. You're wrong. Well, are they? And after a while, you start to kind of think, well, what do they see? Maybe they see the walls and it's really blue. But to go along with the conversations on that, so I hung out with all the crazies and all the bumps. And those were my people. It was kind of like, just like, like what are they called? In the 70s, they had that uh, the circus, Mary Hipsters, I think they were called. Um, those were my people. So growing up, and, and so these people, would, and a lot of the kids, they would try to kind of find out where they fit in this hierarchy. And the only way I guess a lot of kids think that they can do this is they have to put other people down in order for them to step up. And then they would face me. And when it came to words, it was not going to happen. And a lot of times, 
A lot of the people that wanted to run their mouth knew what I could do, and it was kind of like it stopped right there. But then that kind of started to cause a problem going into my later junior high years, and that was that people started to think I was a punk. And I was just out, just had a chip on my shoulder, like whatever. Forget the fact that I was having to deal with this on a constant basis, a daily basis, and it starts to it starts to weigh heavy on me. So the anger started to come a little bit. And it was and maybe I was a punk. I don't know. I always thought I was a really nice guy, and anybody that I knew from that day would always tell me about how nice and sweet I was. But they didn't know that in my head, it was kind of like, all right, I'm just waiting. I am just waiting. I wish somebody would, as people would say now. And so that kind of went on again. And uh, so we were living in Pensacola at that time. Um, Because, again, everything went downhill with the economy in the late 80s. We moved to Pensacola, tried to get a a better footing. Um, It was a lot cheaper than living in Miami. And my dad could get a job, so he did. Always looking for stuff. My mom worked in the university system when she was in Miami. She transferred to one when we lived in Pensacola. So time going on, and you know, um, my and then I started to experience my first going into late junior high school. Started to experience my first times being around other kids whose parents were going into divorce or drug addiction or things like that. That I never really experienced. You always see it on the TV. You know, the crack epidemic. And then you had the AIDS going around. And I had a friend of mine when I lived in Miami. Um, he got a blood transfusion. And as a result of the blood transfusion, he got AIDS. Like seven years old. Like how is a seven-year-old going to get AIDS? Like seriously. So and those types of things, those little seeds started to just kind of... The, I started to realize that at a young age, the world wasn't what I saw. It, like, like almost like a face value kind of thing. So, but, so time goes on, so I'm going in and I'm also starting to see, you know, addiction. Um, uh, one of my friends, she, her stepfather, I always felt was a little too comfortable. And then, lo and behold, later on, um, yeah, it was real comfortable. Um, but just those types of things, and it, it just, and I, had to, I had to kind of deal with myself as a young kid, trying to figure out, because again, I... It's not the words, it's what I see. And what I see is telling me a story that's different than what you're saying. It causes this disconnect. And it's either, do I trust myself or do I trust you? And I'm looking around, and with the exception of my family, I'm not really finding a lot of reason to trust people. Um, just because, just what I see. So, going into that, and it, it, was, it, was, it was eye-opening for sure. And then, I go into junior, and then I go into high school. So, my family moved... And things were rough. Keep in mind, my mom from Cuba, my dad, a southern man, um, civil rights, the whole deal. And then he, we moved into a neighborhood that was the projects. And I, I when I moved into the projects, I just went and I just like, hey, I'm so and so. You want to be my friend? You know, and a lot of them were cool. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll be friends. You know, we play basketball, football, the whole deal. But part of that was also seeing the things that you hear about on TV, but when you see it in person, when you're in it, a whole different ballgame. So then I was hit with another obstacle. And it was, a, it, was a, it was unintended. It was an unintended, not a consequence, but it was an unintended obstacle. So I'm now living in the projects. And I'm going to a high school that is known as a redneck school. So I'm I'm living in the project with a bunch of bunch of black people. I'm super cool with everybody. And I'm going to this redneck school, and it's not cool with them. So, but if you look at me and you see me as white, you don't know my family's story. And so here I am, you know, almost all my friends going into high school, because we moved in the summer before my freshman year. So all the friends that I made up until that point, on the other part of the city, by the way. So it was completely new. I knew one, when I started high school, I knew one person. One person that was not from the neighborhood that I was living in. One person. And they happened to stay there only for a year. But anyways, so I get to school, and every name you could think of, and I would get so mad. I would get, like, because it, it, to me it didn't matter. And my dad would always tell me that, that the color of a man don't matter because we all believe the same. And it's true. And so, and I, and I could not understand 
Well, I, I've seen it, but now I'm in it. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. So then came another problem. So while I was living in the neighborhood, um, and keep in mind, when I joined uh, high school, the reason why we moved to, to that redneck school was because um, I wanted to wrestle. So there was the only school in the area that offered wrestling, so we went there. So I'm, I'm trying to make friends with them. Uh, most of them were cool as well. But then I started running into a problem because I was becoming friends with people that had already had histories. I didn't have any history with anybody at that school. So I was becoming friends with people that had history with people that I was living in the neighborhood with. And I didn't know this, and nobody wanted to speak on it. So then I started having a problem with the people in my neighborhood, and now I'm having a problem with the people at my school. And no matter where I go, there's a problem. So it started going back to this, which I didn't, I really didn't want it to. But, but it was always, you know, everything from, and, and I'm not going to go into detail, but all the slangs and all the derogatory terms you can think of, I was called all of them. For, from white people, black people, Spanish people, it didn't matter what walk of life, it was all me. So I started to become very depressed. And it was around that time, probably my freshman, my freshman year, and then went into my sophomore year, I ran into a problem because um, my dad had gotten diagnosed with cancer. So it was, so now I'm dealing with all this. My dad has cancer. Yeah, I didn't know. I didn't. And it was stop. It was. But the saving grace for me was that I could disappear. It was easy for me to disappear. Because nobody expected. When I tried to put myself out there, that's when I got I had to hit the obstacles. You know, this person, that person, this person, that person, or whatever. And it was just nonstop. And so my dad gets cancer, and uh, so I start staying home a lot more um, instead of hanging out with my friends and stuff like that. Um, so he, unfortunately, he did not survive. And it was like, uh, how do you say it? It was another eye-opening moment. Family says to family, but are they? I had so many people. And even to this day, and, and again, there's no judgment. And I, 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 am, I, everybody's got their reasons. I wish I knew, um, but it doesn't change anything. But at the same time, all is forgiven. So understand, I'm not coming with, with, with vendettas. I'm not coming with any of that. It's just, which is what my truth was. So you have all these family members, and they say, well, we're, Call us if you need us. We're going to be there. We're going to do this. One person. One. Man, I'm so mad. And to this day, that one person, they can call me wherever they are. I'll come running. Everybody else, not so much. Um, you got to know your value and you got to know what you're worth to other people. Um, and this person showed it. Night and day. So, and there was a couple of other people too, but it was one person majority, vast majority. Um, so that all happened. Um, and, and I felt really bad because I, we, we still lived there. And my brother who, you know, the day before my dad died, he woke up. And he, for those of you that don't know, when you're, when you're um, battling cancer and stuff like that, towards the end in hospice care, um, they're, they're trying to manage the pain as much as they can. And as much as they can, they do. But what causes it to happen is that they start sleeping a whole lot. And you, there were days where I did not see my dad's eyes open. And it was just, but it, it started to become normal. I mean, I know as weird as that sounds, it, it started to become normal. Um, but so then my dad went to sleep and he didn't wake up for a few days. Well, when he, he kind of did, but it was just moaning and groaning. And I was having to feed him through tubes for, for ensuring the stomach, all that stuff. And then he would tell me about the monkeys on the wall. And it was just, it was a lot for a 13 year old, 14 year old to go through. So I didn't really go to school that much. And I started to kind of back off and I started to kind of get into my own little, little wall. But music, 
with my escape. And I know, I'm deaf, but like, what, what can music do? So I'm living in the projects, and I keep hearing this music that I am just, 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 I, I just keep gravitating to it. So one day, my next door neighbor, they, they had the, the cars going, and the, it was booming. I could feel it, because remember, I don't live, really listen, I, I can feel it. So, so I asked my neighbor, I said, now, what are you listening to? And he goes, a tribe called Quest. And I said, dude, that feels amazing. He said, that feels amazing. What? And I said, nah, dude, that feels amazing. So I want to sit in my car? Yeah, all day, bro. Yeah. So we sat in the car, and we sat there and listened for probably 30, 45 minutes. We just listened to a tribe called Quest. And it was amazing. I mean, beautiful. Don't get me wrong. I've been listening to music for a long time. Poison is my favorite band of all time. Um, yeah, laugh all you want. They are what they are. Um, but it just really started. So he gave me a tape. With that tape, and he gave me with the little covers in it. Well, at that time, the words didn't come with it. And they normally don't anyways either. But the words didn't come with it. So I, I when my love for music doesn't have anything to do with the words that are spoken. I will read the words and listen to and, and read the poetry. But trying to line the words up with the music at any given time, falling on deaf ears, you know? Ah, see what I did there? Um, but so what I did was, I would go upstairs and I would sit in my room. And we lived in a two-story townhouse. So I would go upstairs and I would sit in my room. And I would put my back to the speakers so I could feel it. And man, it was beautiful. I mean, just absolutely just... Because a lot of people, they hear the boom, 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 boom. But they don't hear the intricacies. They don't hear the chemistry between this person rapping or singing and the way it hits the beat at this time with this, you know, with the troubles, with the high, I mean, just all these things. And then, you, you know, you throw in people who are phenomenal at what they do and they across all the genres. And it's just absolutely amazing. In country music, you'll find it with George Strait. In, in hip hop, you'll find it with, like, I also love my favorite, one of my favorites, Black Star, you know, with most stuff. And it was just like, you find all of these things in the music and who made this and this producer. See, I will know a producer before I know a rapper. Um, by, just by saying, wait a minute, that beat sounds like a so-and-so. Which also leads me to things like EDM, trance, all those types of things. And, and heavy metal, if you listen to heavy metal, it's just blues on cocaine. That's all it is. You know, um, and you, all those things, it's just amazing. Well, that's what I got lost in. And, and then I started to become obsessive. And part of the reason why I started to become obsessive was because and I think it was because it was, it was almost like, how do I say it? So when you listen to music, you're listening to a story or you're listening to something along those lines in which the person who is speaking to you has no judgment of you. They don't even know you, but you feel like you know them. And it was a way of me kind of being in control of a world that I had no control of. And so I, so I got lost in that world. Well, as I got lost in that world, we moved out of the project and we moved into where the other half lived. World of difference. World of difference. And I'm not talking about just the houses. And I mean, beautiful. And, you know, because my dad died and we had some insurance money. So my mom said, you know, we're going to get out of this. Because, again, you're living in a house that your dad died. And every time you come downstairs, you see the bed he laid in. And the bed's not there. The couch is where it was. And you see it every day. Every day, every day. And it kind of plays a toll on you, you know, which is why now I'm a realtor. So now I can understand when someone has lost a significant other that died in a hospital or whatever, and then they come home, they still see that person sitting in the recliner. I get it. I understand it. And there are a lot of people that are like, no, you just get over it. Nah, y'all need to shut up and let them be. They'll get over it in their own way and let it be, whatever it is, you know. So, so we moved into this nicer neighborhood. And, but... Okay, so because I lived there, I got treated way different outside. People heard that I lived in that neighborhood. They were like, oh, and I mean, everyone treated me different. Except for the people that lived in that neighborhood. Because keep in mind, I went to that school, right? So I go to the school, and it was just kind of wonky. There were definitely interesting times. Definitely interesting times. Good and bad. But... So, through later on in my high school years, I was like, the hell with all this. I, mean, I just don't see the point in this. Um, number one, I don't want to go to college. I have nothing that I want to do ever in life that requires college. So, I'm not going to go. 
So I thought, well, if I'm not going to go to college, what's the point of all this? It's just busy work. That's what my head thinking. Now, I'm not saying that's the way it is because to each their own, but and if you have a path that you want to go on that requires college and that's what you want to do, go for it. But if it doesn't, it's an expensive place to learn where you want to do and where you want to be, you know? Um, so I just said, screw it. And then on top of that, it came with the whole trying to deal with my dad dying, trying to deal with the world that I was living in, trying to deal with the hatred, trying to deal with all that stuff. And it just, just didn't stop. And the funny thing is that when you don't deal with your problems, they just start building, just start building, just start building. Eventually, it's going to blow. And it did. But before it blew, so I'm in high school. And finishing it out, um, I actually got expelled 